So why are you here? Um, is it because you're interested in how London is, London's power is generated? Are you here to get some CPD credits? Are you here to learn about BIM, which is Building Information Technology? Or are you here for the coffee and the cake? Well, it doesn't really matter. Um, thank you all for being here, I really appreciate it. Um, so why am I here? Well, my goal as such is to give electricity its 15 or 45 minutes of fame. So I kind of noticed that like electricity doesn't really get um, a, a, a voice or a, a, a chance to speak. We know an awful lot about renewable energy. We see about electric cars, electric vehicles. We know about Tesla's solar panels. We know about tidal energy, all this renewable energy stuff. But what about the existing electricity grid? How are the lights being kept on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year? Even last week we had our storm and you know a bit of wind and we do lose power. So we, I think we should appreciate what we have at the moment and what it takes to keep that power going. Um, and it's not just about electricity, it's not just about voltage and current, it's also about the people, it's about the project management, it's about the financials, and most importantly, the construction of these grids. So the who, so who me? Who am I? Well, I'm Sinead Hanlon, you might have guessed. Um, I graduated as an electronic engineer from NUI Galway in 2006, and then after that, I worked in analog devices as a marketing engineer. So I was in the semiconductor industry and then I made the right choice to go and work for ESB International in 2007, where I worked in the Power System Study Team. And then after that, I worked with Mitsubishi Electric over in London. I worked in transmission, um, and I worked alongside National Grid there as well. And then after a year of that, I got a wee bit itchy feet, and I decided to go into the brave new world of distribution, which you may all know is a bit more fast-paced than transmission. I then left UK Power Networks and I now work with M&W Group in Maynooth, who are a high-tech engineering company um, that deal with um, large-scale semiconductor applications. So this evening I'm going to give you um, the presentation through an example. So a substation I worked on in London, which was very high profile. So I'm going to talk about the who, the what, where, when and why of that substation. So the who. So who generates the electricity? Well, you're probably all aware, National Grid is the transmission system operator in the UK. Um, they're mostly based around the south, the midlands of the UK. Um, they operate at 400, 275, um, and then the distribution then goes to the voltage, voltage is lower, but I'll, I'll show you in more detail how that compares to Ireland. Um, then at the distribution, distribution end, we have UK Power Networks, as I mentioned before, I worked with them. And who actually delivers the projects? Well, that's the London design team, which I was part of, and um, the project managers who manage the financials, and also the infrastructure planning. So they decide what projects are going to go ahead, what projects are going to get funding, how these new projects are going to fit into the existing network. So why was Wimbledon chosen as a project to go forward with on the behalf of National Grid and UK Power Networks? Well, London, accounts for 20% of the UK's power um, and also London has a growth of 5% each year. So at the moment National Grid is going through a seven year rewire of London. So what they're doing is they're kind of doing what they did with the railway, they're actually boring tunnels into the uh, ground in London. A huge operation, of course an awful lot of land, um, an awful lot of people required for it. So what does this mean for Wimbledon? Well, it meant that the existing 275 kV substation we up would be upgraded to a 400 kV substation. And I'll show you that in, in another slide. So this actually involved um, installing six new transformers, 400 kV transformers, installing new tunnels and installing cables to go into these tunnels and also to remove the existing equipment. And I think sometimes people forget about the whole removal of the old stuff. They don't want to hear about that. They want to hear about the shiny new sparkly stuff. So I just should point out that National Grid owned the land at Wimbledon and UK Power Networks leased the land. So that was a very important, um, not conflict, but it was a very important division of kind of where, where people stood when decisions were made. So on the distribution side for National or the UK Power Network side, why was Wimbledon chosen as a project to go ahead with? Well, it's part of a Nine Elms um, upgrade project, which basically is worth about 20 million and it involved um, the Battersea Power Station apartments. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but Battersea Power Station was obviously decommissioned and then a uh, private developer bought them and wanted to make them into a very classy um, apartment complex. 
So that was actually a private developer and private developers and UK Power Networks working together is a little different to how it usually works um, because when a private developer is involved it means that if they say a date they mean a date and if you waver away from that date it's going to cost you UK Power Networks a lot of money. So when they say March 2018 they mean March 2018. Another reason why Wimbledon was needed was because the Northern Line was being upgraded. So I don't know if you can see down the bottom right hand corner, um, between Kennington and Battersea Power Station there is an extra um, tube line or tube, sub tube station. Um, so that also required extra power. So overall they needed 18 uh, megawatts of power by March 2018. So <coughs> with the UK Power Networks aspect of Wimbledon they needed to replace the old existing 132 kV voltage substation with new equipment and also some more connections so obviously to account for this extra load. So this required new equipment, it required rerouting of the cables of the existing connections, adding new connections and then removing the old equipment. So where was it? So it was in Wimbledon, South West London so if you have never been to London or you may know of Clapham, been there before, um, it's south west of Clapham, about 20 minute drive. It looks, when I, when I got the job, when I got the project first, I thought, oh wow, I'm going to be able to go playing tennis every day. Not quite. Um, <laughs> it's not as glamorous as um, Wimbledon Stadium. Um, so this is the uh, substation here on your right. I'll go into that in more detail, but I just wanted to give you an overview of what it looked like. So as I said before about the voltage levels, so voltage levels in the UK and Ireland are slightly different, there's a bit more variety in the UK, especially in London, you have 11 kV, 20 kV, 33 kV, all the way up to 400 kV, Ireland not, not as varied. Um, also London is a very, very um, special city in terms of it has 2.3 million people connected to the grid um, and UK Power Networks is a company on the whole, it covers central um, east and south London and it has 8 million customers so you can just imagine what kind of operation they run um, to keep the lights on. So when did all this have to happen with London? Well the project started in February 2014 um, it moved past concept um, and more oh sorry moved past feasibility and into concept so it had kind of been given the initial go-ahead by senior management. Um, Battersea Power Station apartments needed to be energised by March 2018 and the project would need to be completed by 2023. So that would mean everything, all the national grid work, all the UK power networks work had to be completed by 2023. Sounds like a not a lot of time but there was also a gap in the middle where no work would happen so there was uh, two or three years of intense work. And the main thing to be aware of is to maintain the power throughout. So obviously you'd have outages when you're switching in and out circuits, but the ordinary circuits that weren't supposed to switch out, they're not allowed to go out because London is so close to its load capacity that you can't, it wasn't possible to do that. So just to use kind of an anecdote, because as I may have mentioned at the beginning, um, <coughs> I find sometimes technical uh, presentations can be quite uh, technical and it's probably a bit more fun to have something that's not as obvious about uh, substations. So but I said building substations is a bit like baking a cake. Um, you've got your ingredients and you've got your recipe. Now your ingredients in this case are your existing site, your electrical requirements and your stakeholders. I just want to say talk about safety a wee bit. Um, safety obviously is a very big um, issue in with electricity. You're dealing with such high voltages, <coughs> currents, etc. Um, when I worked with the London design team, um, a lot of the guys I'd worked with had been working there for about 40 years and had seen it all basically. And some of them had very, very near misses. Uh, one guy in particular was in a substation. It was still live and it was flooded. Um, and he touched a panel. So it's he was could not understand how he lived to tell the tale um, but safety was always was always always a big thing um, in UK Power Networks you were never allowed to go on site on your own you always had to go with someone even if it was above ground you know you just weren't allowed so, and, and I really really respected that and I think definitely it's it's something that we need to well obviously we are carrying through and, and keep on with it really um, so the second thing is your recipe so basically um, for Wimbledon we use the design process and BIM, building information modeling. So we introduced a design process that would have distinct uh, design stages and then we also use building information modeling. So along with all the complex design issues, we also had these new two processes to implement. So it was a pretty challenging project to say the least. 
So uh, the existing Wimbledon site, we obviously need to have a site to work on, so um, I'll just go through this now in a bit more detail. So the existing Wimbledon site is here. Um, as I said to you before, it wasn't a very glamorous uh, location. Um, this is the Greyhound Stadium here on your right. The access route was really narrow, and there you have your National Grid 275 KV pylon. So that was my um, workplace for a while. Um, <coughs> so as I said, National Grid owned the land, and so UK Power Net Networks was leasing it. And so for National Grid to build their 400 KV substation, they needed UK Power Networks to move their equipment. So this is all um, UK Power Networks equipment here, and this is a building that needs to be demolished. And so basically, um, UK Power Networks had to, over stages, um, remove all that equipment, and then replace it with this yellow building here, which is um, GIS. Uh, which is gas insulated switchgear. So you're going from air insulated equipment to gas insulated equipment. And then obviously you have loads of room for National Grid's new 400 kV substation and a bit of space down here on the right. Um, and National Grid were hoping to build some apartments there. So that gives you an example of what way the land lies over in uh, London. So <coughs> first of all, <laughs> you may, everyone here I think has worked uh, with electricity for a while and it's appreciated the difference between the records and the reality so going on site is very important and, and figuring out what's actually there as opposed to just going from digital records. The big thing with Wimbledon, it was a running theme throughout all of the stages of it, was the cables. There's cables everywhere, all voltage levels and inv also included like control signals. Um, so the old cables, uh, sorry, all, some of the, the cables were old so they were oil filled and they were leaking. So there's an awful lot of oil in the ground as well, which obviously can contaminate it and make it more difficult to build on. There's also decommissioned cables, which ha were there, but they hadn't been removed. So that was also an issue. So it was a bit like all these cards here in that photo, trying to squeeze everything into a very small space. So just to reiterate um, the space issue, 21 um, connections had to be rerouted into this small space here so you can imagine you've got not l a lot more um, a lot more land basically and here you have only got these two sides where you can actually bring your cables in and you've obviously got your three new connections that are going to give you your 18 megawatts so for this um, the AIS uh, sorry the GIS equipment you need a, s a certain type of um, cable connector and <coughs> it's like this here so basically you bring your cables and you and you bend them up so obviously every Every circuit has got three phases, so it's not, not an easy job. And as well as the high voltage cables, you also have signal cables. So we had signal cables traversing all along here. So you can imagine if you're trying to build on that land, you're kind of going, how am I going to build my foundation if there's all these control signals going up and down, going to various parts of <coughs> the substation. And th that, that trough you can see there was just jam packed full of signals that nobody knew. Um, who owned them or what they were and we had to talk well I had to talk to the site engineer or the site guy and basically there was no way in the world he was going to let us remove them so we had to deal with that then National Grid also had different cable requirements so they had six transformers and um, that would be feeding into our switch gear and um, so their cable setup is slightly different to ours they require a lot more bending radius so this has an impact obviously on the foundation depth um, and they're very, very stringent with that. Um, that became one of the stop scenarios when it was realised the foundation wasn't deep enough for their cables. So um, that, w that kind of thing has an impact on programmes. <coughs> so how do we get around this? Well, this is where BIM really came into its own. Uh, we shared BIM models with Lang O'Rourke, who were the uh, cable designers or design consultants for um, National Grid. They're part of the seven-year rewiring of London. And um, so you can see there is an example, it's not the example of Wimbledon, but it's an example. And you can, you can imagine down the bottom here the type of like cable routing um, design you have to put in, like an awful lot of effort was put into the cable, cable design. And also the stage of works is very important. So you know yourself, you can't just go along and, and stick cables in side by side and do it like that. You have to think about how you're going to disconnect one circuit and reconnect to another side and make sure your power flow and your load flows are all working perfectly. So there are other general site issues that didn't really become apparent or more obvious until as the project progressed. So flooding, um, 
we knew that there was a river beside this substation um, I didn't realise how much of an issue this would be you, I only realised this when you went on site and there literally was cables submerged in water and then it really became apparent that you had to start asking the cable manufacturers okay well can your cables sit in water and if they if for how long can they and it turns out you know certain cable manufacturers do allow for certain flooding and for their cables to be submerged drainage also became a problem there was a lot of um drainage areas that weren't included on existing cable records and apartments so those apartments are literally on the other side of that river you can't really see it there but they literally look in on top of the substation and <coughs> that had issues with noise so uh, they're very very stringent on noise requirements in the UK well in London anyway and basically that's fair enough uh, it just means that when you're trying to schedule like uh, getting transformers in that little narrow laneway or if you're trying to do work especially along with national grid it all has to be coordinated so that the local residents are happy enough with that so what was the overall solution it was to put the substation on stilts so this got around the area of the multi cores of the control signals it allowed the cables to have a bending radius allowed for flooding and also maneuver around drainage but it's obviously not the norm to have a substation sitting on stilts Okay, so the, the next ingredient is our electrical requirement. So, um, Wimbledon basically had everything going. It was 400 kV all the way down to distribution level of 11 kV. It needed 18 megawatts by March 2018. And I sorry, also had the transfer of circuits from old to new and maintained the power. So just to um, reiterate something about central London, I didn't really appreciate how special central London was until I started working there. Um, most of the equipment, if not all of the equipment, is indoors GIS. Sometimes you can have indoors AIS. Um, that's only in really old substations though, and they're not very nice places to be in because they're a bit creepy. But um, what you call it then the next uh, cable connections so all of the obviously we have a lot of overhead line over here I've heard that in Dublin it's getting a lot more underground but with overhead lines you can obviously see your fall so you can see a tree hitting a line in London you don't have overhead lines because it just doesn't happen and um, so all your faults you have to have a very very good uh, protection system to make sure that you pick up on any faults and also clearing those faults or you know um, Fixing your cables is also a massive issue and very, very costly. Underground, a lot of our substations are underground. So uh, like the Shard, all those big high rise buildings, they all have underground substations. Um, and that's okay. Um, it, the kind of issues that come up with that are, you know, how do you get your transformer into the ground? What kind of traffic arrangements do you have? If anything goes wrong with that transformer, how do you fix it? Um, all these things have to come into uh, play. Ventilation is a massive issue. Um, some of these substations are 48 metres below uh, ground level, so you really have to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Access, as again, is a very um, a big issue as well I in all considerations. So the existing system substation operation, well, <coughs> Wimbledon was basically a hobnob or a selection, a variety of cakes, basically. It had had various upgrades at different sections so tran one transformer over here would have been upgraded with this protection in like the 1970s two other transformers or a relay panel would have been done up in the 90s so it was all very much a mishmash of um, electrical operations and also UK Power Networks went through a series of ownership so it went through it was the electricity supply board then it went through EDF then it went through um, that's 24 hour energy I think it was called so all these companies um, have different ways of operating the network and so different up infrastructure changes are made to operate them the way they like them. So the job with this basically was to bring all those mishmash of operations together and make sure that they worked um, going through the process so not obviously to introduce something completely different. It had to work with what was existing. So the new substation would be this amazing amazing substation it would be 31 bays it have four sections 21 new 21 reroutes um, and obviously three new connections and one of the connections is actually also to the American Embassy so this substation while it was very complex and was worth a lot of money it also was very high profile so it was talked about in the House of Commons as one of those like big projects that you know people on the street would know about 
So put a little bit of pressure on making sure that the project got delivered and it didn't slide behind on, um, you know, design deliverables and all that. So, um, so this is uh, the SLD for it. Um, I'm not sure how how much sense it'll make. Um, but basically, as I said before, um, there was four sections to it, and uh, there was the thing that was quite strange about these are the sorry the national grid transformers. There's two on this section, and then four in this section. And actually, as an aside, um, the when I said before there was going to be a bit of a gap between 2000 and 14 and 2023 when the project was being delivered, it was because it would be energised in two stages. So the first the first bar up here or the first section up here would be installed in 2000 or energised in 2018 and the bottom bit would be installed or energised between 20, 2021 and 2023. So that made it even more interesting because you had to deal with um, what would you do with these chambers here when, they, when there was no energy flowing through them or current flowing through them. But anyway, sorry. Um, to go back to the react, we also had reactors at Wimbledon. So the reactors, there was two reactors, and they were there to limit the load current, because Wimbledon was fed by Newcross, which um, was providing issues with um, obviously over load current. So these reactors need to be put here. But the only thing is different about this is that these reactors are double banked. So as you can see, this reactor is connected to a leg of another um, bay, and that was to save the cost of a cost of another base so save equipment on an extra circuit breaker and the protection scheme that had to be designed that I had to design to get that oh my god I think <laughs> they definitely lost out in the cost of that bay because it was such a hassle to design that protection system so many scenarios to envisage when you're when you're taking consideration a reactor um, so yeah and uh, also there's three extra bays included below on the bottom right there that was for future proofing um, because GIS is notoriously difficult to um, add extra bays onto when you've when you've installed it, and I'll talk about that here again. So gas insulated switchgear is what's used mostly in London. Um, the advantages are it's compact. Um, the insulator is SF6 gas, which people are a bit hmm and ha about. It has a few um, environmental implications. If it leaks, it's not so good, and you get penalized. You can get penalized by Ofgem or the regulator, whoever it is. Gas monitoring is a necessary part of SF6 and it's becoming more and more prevalent. A gas monitoring panel can cost up to 100 grand, so it is costly. Um, as I said before, gas insulated switch gear, it is quite difficult to future proof it um, in the future. This is because, um, for example, if that's an awesome switch gear and that's part of a framework contract that the utility is using, in six years time the framework contract changes to ABB and then if you want to add on an extra few bays to that it's, it's not going to be so easy to connect ABB to Siemens you have to get like um, connections for that then maintenance um, here's a gas monitoring diagram I know it says 400 kV but you can get them for 132 as well um, the gas monitoring um, sorry the gas zone diagram sorry <laughs> my head Gas zone diagram was actually uh, one of the first things that was looked at when the tender was put out for this um, substation because it was very important that if there was an issue with one of the bays that we wouldn't lose a bus bar. And um, actually one of the, one of the switch gear suppliers was out and out, um, had, re had a lot of zones, so I'm not sure how, how aware you are of the gas zone monitoring or gas zones in general, but in, you have to have like a, um, a buffer chamber if you want to like do an outage, you have to have a chamber that's at like half pressure so that you can do an outage on one side of it. So some um, suppliers are quite stingy with their chambers and so you would lose half a bus bar uh, if you got had to do maintenance or had an outage or whatever. So then the protection of equipment is also a massive electrical requirement when building a substation. So this is when I had my elect lead electrical design engineer hat on. Before this I kind of had my pr project coordinator hat on. Um, so electricity hasn't changed but equipment has and it's gotten more advanced and it has a lot more signals. And it is still all about the money like most things in life. So apart from our GIS equipment, the most expensive thing in a substation is the transformer. Um, transformers have extremely long lead times, as you're all well aware, and um, they are expensive, and they can have an awful lot of faults. So what's the protection 
So how do you protect it? Well, our, our, the transformer and the equipment, you have protection relays, so they monitor the flow of current within the substation, backwards and forwards, basically covering every part of the substation equipment. It monitors flow um, of the incoming and outgoing current, especially bus bar protection is especially important because power in needs to be the same as power out if you've got a massive issue. Um, it also covers the cable connections between substation A and substation B, so I'll just take that as an example. Constantly sending signals to each other going, is there a problem, is there a problem? And then if it says, no, sorry, yes, there is a problem, and then a signal sent to isolate the fault, then we always have backup protection just in case that signal wasn't sent. The worst case scenario is that the relay is faulty, and then the backup protection doesn't work, and then you have the fault continuing. So I've included these two photos here to kind of give an example of why it matters, uh, how important the protection is. So obviously in London you have to open up the ground to get at the cable, whereas in Ireland or in more rural networks you can physically see, you can get a, a substation engineer to drive out and say, all right, yeah, I can see that's the fault. Whereas in London it's not so easy, you're only dealing with cables, you have to rely on the signals, you have to rely on your equipment, your, your relays, so your relays have to work. And unfortunately, um, <laughs> there have been cases where relays have been known to be wobbly. So um, it does happen, um, and it has happened in the past. So uh, the protection scheme just needs to be kept tip top. So the fault detection in real terms, um, the equipment gets damaged, obviously, and the customers get lost. Um, and why do people care about customers getting lost? Well, the regulator obviously penalizes the utility when they don't supply the power when they're supposed to. So I think a good example of this would be the Kingsway fire in April 2015. I don't know if you are aware of it, but it was a massive deal because I was working for UK Power Networks at the time and it was like the biggest blow to their ego. Um, so basically uh, there was a fault on the cable and it was in the same tunnel as gas and so basically went on fire and the insulation was compromised and so basically for over a day it was on fire and this was in um, Kingsway which is in central London basically Holborn which is a very very elusive part of London you've got your theatres you've got your posh cafes so they estimated that the damage was about 40 million because of the loss of earnings and local businesses were not very happy so that just gives an example of what can happen if you know your protection scheme is not to scratch so then on to the stakeholders so um, this is where it really got interesting so um, as well as being the electrical design engineer, I was also the project coordinator for the design element. So um, <coughs> that meant within UK Power Networks, um, obviously you had the design team, you're working with the cable designer, you're working with uh, the CAD technicians, but also you're working with the asset management team, the infrastructure planning team in particular for like the outages and, and the rerouting pr proposals. Um, but also uh, working with National Grid in order to work out their cable routing scheme and obviously Alstom were the equipment supplier, so I had to work an awful lot with them. Jacobs were the civil designers for this. We were quite low on resources in the UK Power Network, so usually the civil design is farmed out to external consultants. So all their technical queries, all the information needed to go through me and farm back out. So I felt very much like an octopus at times, um, if not all the time. But um, it's a very much a learning experience, so uh, yeah, you get pretty good at knowing a lot, <laughs> about, no, a, a little bit a lot. Um, so the, the one thing I did learn about the project coordination is um, how important it is to listen to people. Um, sometimes people just want to be listened to, <laughs> and uh, even though it can be you know tough going, especially during in a meeting situation, you just have to listen to them because they're obviously trying to tell you something. Um, also consider meetings so I found that you know you can go to 10 to 20 million meetings but are they actually any good you can get nothing done you can go on site and meet someone on site but is it actually worth worthwhile so in order to get my job especially being an electrical design engineer you know you're spending two days a week um, trying to do electrical design work and then those three days a week you have to have your hat on of project coordination and, and your brain physically it's very very hard to go into you know dealing with relays and protection signals and then the next day you're talking about drainage issues um, so you have to be very careful with like what meetings you attend why you're attending them what's the outcome of attending that meeting who you're gonna meet and what you're gonna get sorted um, also just to find the project importance so um, UK Power Networks as I mentioned there 
had a very uh, lack, big lack of resources, especially in the design team. So when you were saying to someone, I need you to give me this cable route proposal for that circuit by next week, you know, you have to justify why it's important. And lucky enough for me, um, Wimbledon was quite a high profile uh, project, so I sometimes got a bit of leeway that way. But other than that, um, if you didn't kind of fight for your project, fight your ground, then usually your, uh, your, you would go down, go down their list of priorities. Also the importance of visiting site, um, obviously for looking at records versus reality, but also meeting um, site engineers, because definitely in my experience, I've noticed that there's a huge gap between, um, it's kind of like doctors and nurses. When you go on site, uh, the site guys kind of look down on you because you're a design engineer and they think you're only a desk jockey, what do you know? When, when it comes to installation, it's completely different and you don't know what design is, blah, blah, blah. So when you go out on site and listen to the guys on site and take in what they've learned, they have so much knowledge and so much, so much to give back and lessons learned of what actually happens on site, what's the best way to go forward, what actually works. Yes, yeah, something might, might look well on a piece of paper, but will it actually work practically on a day-to-day? On -day? And these guys obviously are the ones that work with the equipment um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so yeah, otherwise you don't get a very nice cake. Um, so <coughs> the, the recipe or the design process was used, uh, was based on the Royal Institute of Architects uh, design scheme, sorry, and uh, basically had distinct design stages. Uh, uh, this might seem really obvious to some people, they're like, of course you're going to have distinct design stages, sure, how would you get anything done? Well, you'd be surprised. Um, as I, there's always been a, a history of, of low resources and so projects just got done. It was like, a, we need to get them done, get them done. And because the people you're working with are really, really into electricity, they've been working with it for 40 years, they just love their job, they don't mind it. So if someone has decided in May, oh, I want a 10 bay GIS substation, and then in July they say, oh no, I want a 5 bay AIS substation, equipment, whatever. The design engineer goes, oh, it's fine, it's grand, I'll do that. And they don't think about resources. So they never actually had an idea of how long anything would actually take. So when someone would go to them, you know, we start getting private developer work, you just don't really know what to tell them or how long a project's going to take. So that's why this was needed, because it was just getting out of hand. Um, <coughs> and also, yeah, it brings in frozen designs so no one can change their mind, which is hugely frustrating. And um, when you're trying to design something, you have to go back to square one again. Um, the information exchange list was uh, an Excel sheet or a series of Excel sheets that was basically used, that I use all, all the time as part of this design process and it's also part of BIM. So the information exchange list was basically a list of tasks, uh, itemised tasks for each um, design stage and it was updated um, at, at the end or during like say design review meetings or if there was a huge like, um, if there was a big change in scope or whatever you, you would update that or I would update it. Um, so what is BIM? Well, build, BIM is Building Information Modeling and it basically is um, a 5D AutoCAD tool. So 3D is obviously everywhere now, everyone uses 3D, but what makes BIM so special is that it also can use uh, financials and project planning. So you could basically find out how long it will take to build your substation and click on a wall and go, oh, okay, that, that wall cost two grand to make because I had how many days and how many pieces of material that were used and how many um, members of staff or whatever. BIM really came into its own for clash detection and as I also said about cable routing, um, it was massively awkward because there was an awful lot of legal implications with sharing BIM models with National Grid, with sharing with Jacobs. So it doesn't come without its complications and I think that's sometimes why people are a bit dubious about it because there's a huge, it's like turning a really slow wheel to try and get people to use it. But overall, it does avoid errors on site and it, it gets rid of them in the early stages uh, before they become a, an even bigger and more expensive issue on site. So BIM is used, sorry, at the beginning, I, I, sorry, I mentioned I work for M&W, um, who are a high-tech engineering consultancy in Germ or German, sorry, but they're in Beneath. And they've been using BIM for at least four years now. Um, they work for confidential clients um, all over the world and they require it as a just as a, a given like so it, it's included in all their tenders so that just gives you an example of, of what a complete BIM um, model looks like it looks very realistic and um, you have like these work through or these walkthrough scenarios where you can literally um, walk around it as if it's already built um, look quite nice as well 
So here is the um, BIM information checklist, exchange checklist, sorry now that should have been earlier. Um, and it's literally, it might be hard to see there, but literally just a list of items that are um, assigned to people and kind of comments on them. And obviously there's more associated documentation alongside this information exchange list. But just make, this was actually part of the contract when the project was going out for tender. So if ever there was like an issue, you could always refer back to the information exchange list and go look, you, you agreed that this is your um, design responsibility. Um, this is, you know, you just have to, you have to do it like, because there were issues with like compensation events. Um, and so it was always good to have this exchange list to say, look, you signed up for this. So here an example of the BIM design stages that have been slightly changed um, from the REBAS, the Royal Institute of Architects. So uh, the feasibility stage, PP10, was uh, just after, sorry, I, I came after that. Um, so I was involved with the conceptual design phase and the developed design stage. Um, conceptual was when you, I, sorry, I, I um, put together the SLD going for tender, and then developed is when you have awarded the contract and you're working with your uh, civil design consultants and national grade on a more like higher level. So just to go back to BIM uh, in, in general, um, BIM is a legal requirement uh, for all UK public buildings as of May 2016. It is at level two, so I think level two is the kind of the very, very basic BIM level. Um, I assume that just means 3D, um, but it, ha it is proposed to be used in Ireland to build the children's hospital um, that is proposed. So it's obviously uh, taking, on, it's obviously being um, integrated over here in Ireland, so that's great. Um, so come to the end. Um, I hope you know how to build a substation. I think a lot of you are from electricity background so you probably know more than I do um, but anyway I hope you um, enjoyed it and you can find me on LinkedIn um, under Sinead Hanlon. Thank you.